By the end of this video, you're gonna learn and master three most important principles every chess player must know. Chances are you have already heard about at least one of them, but the real power lies in using them the right way. If you do that, you're gonna be ahead of 95% of all chess players immediately. What's up chess player and welcome to the Journey of the God Master, the place where you can improve every single aspect of your chess game. Today I'm gonna show you two absolutely incredible and astonishing games, probably the most famous games in chess history from the perspective of learning exactly those top three principles that are gonna change the way you play chess forever. Those games are called Evergreen Game and Immortal Game, and the reason behind that is that it has been played almost 200 years ago, but is as relevant today as ever. Let's dive into the Evergreen Game first. It has been played between Adolf Anderson and John Dufresne. The game started with e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, the most popular moves even nowadays. I mean, that is already incredible. Like, almost 200 years ago, people played the same moves as are played today with all of those engines with super power and super knowledge we have today we still play absolutely the same moves that is incredible bishop c4 of course that makes much more sense in terms of 19th century than bishop to b5 which is the rule Lopez, because here the bishop is immediately keeping an eye on this f7 pawn which is basically the main target there should be to put pressure on this king Bishop c5 has been played, that is well known as Chaka Piana or the Italian game. And now White says, well, no easy game for you, nothing like simple here. I'm gonna play b4, which is known as Evans Gambit. Let me know in the comments if you knew this opening before. That is a Gambit, that is a sacrifice from the very beginning. The idea is to deflect that bishop from being active here on this diagonal to open up the b-file, the b2 square potentially, and of course try to attack in the uh, center immediately with c3. And that is exactly what happened here. We are winning the time. Chess is all about the time. It's the most important resource and you should always, always and always think about the time in chess. If you can sacrifice a pawn between a very important tempo, that might be worth it. Because you're improving your position, you're developing your pieces, while your opponent just makes those absolutely useless moves in terms of winning that pawn and then pushing the bishop back. So bishop a5 has been played and d4 immediately, even though the castles still hasn't been made and that pawn is pinned so you cannot take it back uh, on d4. Why is still playing that? Why? Because he wants to attack immediately, he wants to open up that center and create those opportunities to attack. And now of course he goes for castles because it's essential to make sure your king is secure before you go all in with your attack. And notice that black skin is still far away from being castled, it's really in danger in the center of the board. Instead of playing knight to f6, which is the most logical developing move trying to castle as fast as possible, black is playing here d3. The idea is very clear to avoid this c takes d move, which is going to be perfect for white in terms of the pawn structure of you, but it's a wasting move and once again wasting time is not desirable for you at any point. So the first chess principle that you absolutely need to master is developing your pieces. That is an absolutely crucial thing in chess. You have to develop all of your pieces, you have to do it as fast as possible and you need to find the most active squares for all of your pieces. Imagine you are a coach of a sports team and your task is to win the game. You have two options. You can either bring two of your star players to the field immediately and start attacking, start uh, uh, going on, uh, attack your opponent, or you can first bring all of your pieces into the field and then using the power of combinations and connections between all of those players, you can use all of them to attack and score those goals. Which one are you gonna choose? If your IQ is more than 50, you're definitely gonna choose the second option. And that is exactly what you need to do in chess. But for some reason, so many lower rated players are not doing it. They are developing just a few of those pieces and then start attacking immediately, forgetting about everything else at all. That is a huge, huge mistake. And hopefully you're never gonna do that again after this video, because these two games are just perfect example 
why you need to develop all of your pieces as well as how you can be punished if you are not doing that as black is doing here not playing knight f6 so how white is using that queen to b3 developing yet another piece and creating an immediate threat here attacking the f7 pawn black is playing queen to f6 trying to defend it that is quite a good move because not only they are uh, defending against this threat they're also developing a new piece Ideally, you should always combine multi-purpose moves together so that, well, you're doing a lot of things in one move. Why is continuing the attack? e5, attacking the queen, creating yet another threat and going forward. Queen goes to g6 and rook e1. Well, the second principle that you must learn, that you must master in chess, is about centralizing your pieces. All of the important actions are going to happen in the center of the board. Think about your chess pieces as Wi-Fi. I mean, if you have a lot of devices and you want to connect it to the Wi-Fi, you want to be near to the Wi-Fi router because otherwise you you're going to have a very slow connection or no connection at all. That happens if you are placing all of the pieces to different sides of the board. They are not connected. They are not playing good together and that's not going to work. So you should be always aiming for placing your uh, pieces in the center of the board especially the rooks they love open files they love the center files and we are gonna learn it in this game as well as all of your other pieces if you have a choice you always want to go towards the center if there is no very very good reason uh, to, to do otherwise and please don't look at those magnus carson games when he's going crazy going to all edges of the board well, if you're Magnus Carlsen, you are allowed to do whatever you want. But if you are just a, a regular guy that wants to improve your chess, never repeat those mistakes and always try to centralize your pieces. That is essential. Let's see now how White uses the power of these two principles in this game. So the game continued with knight g2 e7. Black is finally developing the pieces. And now bishop goes to a3. Even though the bishop is not really placed in the center of the board, but it's attacking that whole diagonal, uh, which includes those old squares, and that is very, very horrible for black. That is why black is coming with a desperate move here, b5. That is sacrificing the pawn, but that is not a good strategy, not the strategy you would like to follow instead of like consolidating all of your pieces and having a clear plan. Black is making one move here, one move there. That is not how you need to play chess. So why this taking here? Of course, you're always starting with the most active move. Uh, you're never going back without a very good reason. You always start with those moves forward. Bonus tip at this point, just never go back unless that's absolutely necessary. Black is playing rook to b8, at least developing a new piece, but it turns out this rook is not going to play a huge role in the game. In fact, that's going to be quite a useless piece. Bishop goes to b6, basically blocking this rook, and that is the reason why it was never active in this game. Knights to d2, finishing the develop. Now, notice that all of the minor pieces of the white side are developed here. Once you are done with that, remember to also develop your major pieces. This queen and this rook are already developed. This one is remaining there, and it's going to be a very, very important move at some point of the game. So bishop b7 well bishop might be potentially very very strong so both sides are trying to develop their pieces but of course white is more active and faster with that so what now has been played is knight to e4 back to the topic of centralizing the pieces i mean that is a golden golden rule please remember and always always use it it's so crucial not only just remember it on the back of your head like yeah centralizing is important blah 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 no you literally have to think about that making your every single move and always check uh, your decisions against those golden principles because they exist there for a reason for already multiple hundreds of hundreds of years and this game proves it. Black is playing here queen to f5, which is a huge mistake because black is breaking that golden rule, one piece, one move. You have to follow this rule to be able to achieve that goal of developing all of your pieces as active as possible and as fast as possible. So try to pause the video for a second and find the best move for white here. Yes, you're absolutely correct. It's bishop takes d3. I mean, if that wasn't your move, I'm sorry about that. But that is a very logical move because not only we are getting rid of this d3 pawn and opening up the d file, which of course is going to be crucial later on, but we also create a huge threat of winning the 
uh, queen immediately with knight to d6 or knight to f6 and that means that black has to spend yet another tempo with their queen wasting even more time so they are not in time to finish their development. Black goes queen to h5 here and that is the golden moment here to understand another very important thing in chess. White is a huge crucial advantage here even though the material is absolutely equal. Why that? Well because white's pieces are much more active and because they have more spaces and they have those time and ideas to attack the opponent. And the opponent is not in time to finish his development. That is as simple as that. That is why I'm telling you that those principles are crucial because they help you to outplay your opponent to get a decisive advantage without even winning a single pawn there. So if you have a situation like that, you have to remember that you must use your initiative. Because it's not an extra material, it's gonna disappear if you don't use it. The first World Chess Champion, Will Games Tennis, said it so well. If you have the initiative, you must use it. Otherwise, your opponent is gonna just need a few moves to stabilize the situation and the advantage is gone. So White is starting with the most active opportunities here. You remember the four-step system formula, checks, captures, threads, and active moves those are the steps you must always follow if you want to find the best move in every possible chess position. If you haven't mastered this formula to perfection yet, I have made a dedicated video about this formula right here, but please watch this one till the end because those two are going to be so useful for you in a combination. So what are those most active opportunities here in this position? Of course, we always start with a check. There are two checks available, knight d6 and f6, and white decided to sacrifice a knight here with knight f6. Now, even though it's not objectively the best move, it's very difficult to handle because, well, that's a fork here, so you absolutely must take it. But if you do, then the e-file is going to be opened. We are going to take this uh, piece back because the knight is pinned. It's absolutely not possible to save it. And why it's idea is simple. I want to get to your king. Once I do that, that's going to be checkmate and the game is done. Black plays here, rook to g8, which is, by the way, the only good move in the position, activating another piece, taking advantage of the fact that g file is open. So once again, acknowledging the most important principle of the chess opening, which is developing all of your pieces. At least this rook is very active, immediately creating some threats. Queen f3 is an idea. This bishop, if it's going to be open, that's going to be a monster. But unfortunately, white is just more active and the first one to deliver very strong, uh, very strong threats here. Please feel free to pause the video for a second because that's a crucial moment for you to find the best move for white here. Okay, I hope you did that because that's gonna make sure that you have mastered that first principle that we have learned today. Remember what I have told you about this rook, it's gonna play a huge role in this game and that is the only piece that is not developed yet. So. Rook a to d1, brilliant move here. It's brilliant because it's sacrificing the knight, but it's not about the knight, it's about the fact that we bring all of our pieces into the game to make the great use of it. Now Black said, well, you are crazy. You have just forgotten that your knight is hanging, the pawn is pinned, and I can just grab it. I'm gonna win a knight, threaten checkmate in one, but of course, Chess is more complex than that, and chess is a beautiful, absolutely astonishing game, so please feel free to find why queen takes f3 is a mistake. Well, like I said, all of white's pieces are developed, whereas black's pieces are not really taking part in the attack and the defense, maybe in the attack more, but in terms of the defense, it doesn't help at all. Basically, those knights are the only defenders for the king. So what should we do to get to the king? Of course, we need to remove those defenders. So white plays, rook takes e7, knight takes, and now another brilliant move. If you still don't uh, know what it is, feel free to pause the video again. You're gonna enjoy it so much. Meanwhile, I'm gonna reveal it to you, of course, that is queen takes d7, brilliant queen sacrifice here. The idea is very clear. White is just trying to remove those defenders. d7 was guarding the king, helping the king to be safe there. So white is sacrificing the entire queen just to remove this one pawn because that allows white to get to the king and deliver the checkmate. Now black plays, king takes, bishop goes to f5, that is a double check. So there is absolutely no way to stop the double check by blocking it. You only need to go somewhere with a king. The king doesn't really have a lot of squares because if you go to the c6 one, that would be a beautiful checkmate here after bishop to d7. So black went back 
but it doesn't help because bishop d7, king f8, bishop takes e7, checkmate. That is the evergreen game. I mean, that is a fantastic one, but we still haven't discovered the third principle, which is the most important one to make you ahead of 95% of all chess players. To do that, we are gonna take a look at the immortal game right now. The immortal game has been played between the same guy, Adolf Anderson. I mean, he was the best player back in the time in the entire world, and he played against Kizaritsky. Now, the game started with e4, e5, and f4. That is a king's gambit, that is a dream for 19th century, because that allows the white player to immediately shake the balance to get to some crazy crazy line and outplay the opponent. Now we know that objectively that's not the best opening you might try, but it's not about what the engine says in chess, it's about putting pressure on your opponent, and that is, that is the foundation of the third most important principle we are gonna learn later on. So, black takes here on e4, bishop c4. So, it's all about developing your pieces as fast as possible. And of course, Adolf Anderson knew that that is a crucial thing in chess and that is what he's trying uh, to do, even at the cost of losing the right to castle, because it's all about bringing off your pieces and attacking your opponent. So b5 has been played, that is the way people have played back in the time. They don't care about the material, they just want to be as active as possible. And frankly, if you would uh, use that approach in your games, I would argue you're gonna be such a stronger chess player, you're gonna win so many more spectacular games, and in the end of the day, that is why we play chess. White is taking the pawn, because you remember, we never ever go back without a very good reason. If we can go forward, if we can grab something, we do it. So, knight to f6, we play knight to f3, that is another move with a tempo, developing a piece, that is basically the best case scenario to develop your pieces. Not only you do that, but you also attack uh, your opponent's piece, create a threat and win the time, and well, you already remember how important time in chess is. Black plays queen to h6, but h6 is not a beautiful square for this queen to be. White plays d3, which is a fine move because it's opening up the bishop here, but not the most active. There was an opportunity to go even further and maybe d4, sacrificing yet another pawn. But, uh, well, you're gonna see <laughs> many more sacrifices in this game, so I guess this one is not necessary. So I guess Adolf Anderson decided that this one is not necessary here. Knight h5, well, Black is trying to support this f4 pawn as much as possible because, well, that's essential to stop White's attack, as Black thinks about it. But you remember about the most important principle, one move, one piece. And Black is breaking that principle. That is not gonna end well. Another important principle, the second one that we have learned, centralizing your pieces. And now look at those pieces. Both of them are on the edge of the board. It's not great. It's not the way you're supposed to play chess, and black is gonna be punished for that. But first, white is doing the same mistake as well. Knight h4, that is not the best move here, and the engine disapproves it. Why? Because it's not developing a new piece, it's making the second move with the same piece, and it's uh, sending the knights to the edge of the board, and you know the knight on a rim is dim, so that is not the way you should play. But, well, white wanted to attack, white wanted to go forward and create those threats, and also that kind of stops this knight to g3 check idea, which is basically a fork, winning the rook, so that was, well, a way to deal with this threat. The best move, if you are curious here for white, is rook to g1, so that's not, like, the most obvious move on the planet, so I can understand that knight h4 felt more active for white. So, Black played here, queen to g5. Notice, notice that is a double attack here. The knight and the bishop here all of a sudden are under attack. The only way to save both of the pieces is to use the knight to block the queen, so nothing can be taken. But black is trying to attack as much as possible, and white doesn't care about it. Instead, white plays g4, creating a counter threat. And by the way, remember this principle of never going back. Instead of going back somewhere with the bishop, because there is absolutely no way to go forward, uh, no, all of the squares are under control, white is creating a counter threat. When one of your pieces is under attack, the most active way to deal with it is creating a counter threat. And that is exactly what white is doing here. 
Black is going back with the knight saying, well, now you must do something about your bishop because, well, it's hanging, I'm gonna take it. But white says, I don't care about the bishop, I just want to create threats against you. You can take my bishop all you want, I'm gonna play rook g1 and create yet another threat for you, namely the move h4. And that is exactly what happened here. Black took that bishop, black was greedy and now they're gonna pay the price because h4 is attacking that queen and the queen is in huge, huge trouble. Well, it doesn't have a lot of squares to go. Queen g6, basically those two squares are the only one that are available for black and that's not enough because we are attacking the queen yet again. Queen goes back and now queen f3. Now bishop takes f4 is a threat to win the queen immediately here. So here is the third most important chess principle you absolutely need to learn and master and then of course use in every single one of your games. Create as many threats for your opponent as possible. You have not just to be active, you need to constantly put pressure on your opponent because chess is a psychological game. You need to put as much pressure. You absolutely need to create that psychological siege for your opponent because if he constantly has that feeling of danger coming, then it's so much more difficult for him to play and chances that he's gonna make a mistake are much higher and you're going forward. You're never gonna win a game just sitting there and waiting for your opponent to blunder. I mean, sometimes you might, but it's not the right strategy. This way you're not gonna improve a chess and never get anything significant in chess. You need to be active, but not only that, you need to constantly attack your opponent and create meaningful threats. Now, I don't ask you to play the hope chess. Hope chess is when you create a threat which is not a useful move for you. You're going somewhere, I don't know, here, saying that, well, I'm gonna attack this pawn, and if I do that, that's gonna be great. But you're basically hoping for your opponent to blunder it, because if he just protects the pawn, then your knight is absolutely stupid there on a3 and it didn't bring anything. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about creating meaningful threats. Like instead of that, going here to c3 with the same idea to attack this pawn on b5, but at the same time improving your knight's position. Even if he doesn't blunder, it's still a useful move for you because this knight is going towards center and you're developing yet another piece to an active square. Okay, back to the actual game here. Bishop takes f4 is such a huge threat, winning the queen immediately, that black decided the only way to stop it is to play knight g8. But you know about those move backwards, you never go back, first of all, and also instead of developing a new piece, you actually undevelop the piece that already has been developed. Now, except for the queen, no pieces from the black side are really active, are really developed. And that is not a strategy you should follow that never can work. Now, instead of that, of course, black is already in trouble, but bishop b7 was possible. That is a very difficult move to find. That is why I'm advocating this approach that you should always create threats for your opponent because you make this task incredibly, incredibly difficult for your opponent to find all of those right opportunities. Well, here you basically have to sacrifice the knight because after bishop takes f4, there are no squares for the queen, but you have knight takes g4. And now if you take on g5, then there is knight h2 and yes, white is winning an extra piece at the end of the day, but black has a little bit of compensation and can still fight. Instead, black played this move knight g8, which does save the queen, but of course loses so much time that allows white to just destroy black. Let's see how. Queen goes back to f6 and now coming back to the move I mentioned earlier, we need to develop all of our pieces, as you remember, not just a handful of them, but literally all of them. And we also need to find the most active squares. Like if you have realized that this knight has to be developed because that's the only minor piece that is not developed yet, you should now choose the most active square for it. Once again, a3 is a stupid, stupid square. After a6, it has absolutely no squares to go. d2 is also not a great one because this c4 square is covered. So knight c3 is the best move. Not only you're developing the knight, you're also creating basically a double threat because while well, taking on b5 is dangerous, the knight might get to c7 and d6 afterwards, as well as knight d5 with a tempo attack and the queen threatening the knight c7 is also extremely dangerous. So developing your piece and at the same time creating two threats, that is a dream case scenario that you should always uh, be looking for. Black is finally developing at least one of their minor pieces, bishop c5, and at the same time attacking this rook on g1 because, well, it wasn't possible to stop all of white's threats anyway, so they decided at least create a threat of their own. 
knight to d5 of course that is a great move remember the second very important principle centralizing your pieces instead of going to the side even winning that pawn chess is not about the pawns chess is about delivering a checkmate and when your opponent's skin is in the center and you centralize as many pieces as possible you have many more chances to deliver a checkmate black plays here queen takes b2 that is the most active move deciding that well i want to create as many threats for you mr anderson as possible and that should give me some chances in the meantime i'm also winning some pawns but of course in this position nobody is going to survive till the end game so the number of pawns actually it doesn't matter at all. It, it never matters unless you reach the end game. But if you plan to deliver a checkmate, you just don't care about the pawns. You might use it to sacrifice it or to deflect your opponent to achieve your goals. When I try to teach this very important principle to my students, like you must always be aggressive, you must always create threats for your opponent, you must always go forward, so many of them, especially lower rated, are saying, well, it's so easy for you to tell me that, but I have a fear, I'm afraid of going forward because I might miss something. And I'm like, come on, we are already playing chess, we are not hockey players, we are not boxers, what are you afraid of? We are not risking our life, we are not risking our health playing chess, so we might as well just use all of our opportunities, go forward, attack as passionate as we can and see what happens. This time though, white actually makes some mistakes here. They make an active move, bishop to d6, going forward, sacrificing basically everything there is to sacrifice, but unfortunately, that's not a perfect move. Let's see what happens here. Well, the best move objectively for uh, black to play queen takes a1. And then after king to e2, it's not great to take this rook, either with a queen or with a bishop, because no matter what, that's going to be checkmate in two here, knight g7 and bishop c7. And that was the reason why white sacrificed that pair of rooks. So the right thing for white, for black is just to take this uh, rook on a1 with a check and after king e2 just go back to b2. But that was just too difficult for black to find. Instead, he decided to take the other rook, the rook on g1 here. And the idea is very similar. Now he just wants to grab both of the rooks with a check, but unfortunately chess is just not working like that because white is playing e5 here and the whole purpose of this move is to block this queen from the g7 square that is the only thing that matters for white he doesn't care about his rooks at all he's saying you want to take my rooks take the all all i want to do is deliver you a checkmate but for that strategy to work he needs all of other pieces those rooks are just used to deflect his opponent from what's really important. But all of the other pieces are taking incredibly active part and you're gonna see every one of the pieces are used to deliver this checkmate here. So black is taken with a check, another rook. I mean, what can be better than that? But then after king to e2, it turns out black has two extra rooks and an extra piece. I mean, that is a tremendous material advantage, but there is absolutely no way to stop the checkmate. Why? Well, because there is absolutely no point in having those extra pieces if you don't use it. As long as your pieces are not, not active, it doesn't just doesn't matter whether you have it on the board or not. For example, this rook on eight. Okay, that is your extra piece, but why on earth do you need it? You don't use it and you're never gonna be able to use it because it's just too late. Your king has absolutely no defenders and those pieces are on the other part of the board, also not taking part in the game. Yes, they're active, they have one, two rooks, but in terms of what's gonna happen to this black skin, they are absolutely useless. And that is why white is winning here with a beautiful sacrifice. Knight a6, well, black is trying something. Black is trying to develop a piece and controlling the c7 square, which is, of course, very important, saving uh, black from this checkmate in two here with knight to g7 and bishop c7 checkmate. But knight g7 is still coming, king goes to d8, and now feel free to pause the video for a second to find this brilliant, brilliant checkmate in two moves here. Of course, that is queen to f6, check, sacrificing the queen here, knight a8, and now bishop to e7. The whole purpose of sacrificing the queen here, just as in the last game, is to deflect this defender. So when you're attacking, when you want to attack your opponent's king, you need to deflect his defenders. And knight takes f6 here, is not controlling the e7 square anymore. That is why checkmate is possible. 
now you know what those top three principles to win at chess are and how to use it. The only thing left for you is to master that four step systems formula to find the best move in every possible position. So you know what to do, now you need to learn how to do it. And in this video I prepared a ultimate guide for you to become a tactical monster and of course to use that formula to your advantage.